Okay, welcome back students. Um, in this video, we're going to talk about calculating percent yield. This is the last section in chapter one. And so hopefully you have your books out, you're following along in your guided notes, and we'll fill out this last section in chapter one. Okay, so let's get the pen working real fast. Um, percent yield. You're supposed to write down the definition for percent yield. Here it is. Percent yield is the actual yield of a product as a percentage of the theoretical yield. Let me read that again. It is the actual yield of a product as a percentage of the theoretical yield. So there's a couple of things I underlined there. One is actual yield and what is theoretical yield. Actual yield is what we actually get if you were to run the reaction. Theoretical yield um, we're going to talk about in this next bullet point. Theoretical yield is the amount of a product that is supposed to form when all of the limiting reactant is used up. So the way I think about theoretical yield, it's the amount of product that we're supposed to form in theory. So theoretical starts with um, the root word there would be theory. So in theory, if all of this limiting reactant was used up, that's the amount that we're supposed to form. So, in chemistry, we don't, we don't always form what we're supposed to. We don't always reach the theoretical yield. So, if we, we're usually going to get a number that's, that's a little bit smaller than theoretical yield, and we call that the actual yield. Anyway, here's how you find percent yield. If you plug it in this formula, we're going to be using this formula for the rest of the video. So, percent yield is equal to the actual yield divided by theoretical yield, and then you times that number by 100 to get a percentage. Okay, so we take the actual yield that we get from the reaction, divide it by what we're supposed to get in theory, and then we times it by 100. So why do chemists use percent yield? Percent yield is, an important, is important as an indicator of the efficiency of a particular reaction. So what we're measuring by percent yield is how efficient this reaction uh, occurred. And uh, so chemists use it all the time as a way to just show how efficient a reaction was. So uh, obviously 100% yield is great, it's fantastic. Most of the time we don't actually get that, so it's, our percent yield is going to be some, something lower than 100%. And, so, and there's a lot of reasons for a percent yield being lower than 100%. Maybe, there's, maybe you made errors in your calculation, or maybe you made errors in measuring. Maybe your electronic balance just wasn't calibrated right, or um, maybe the reaction is run under the wrong conditions. So there's a lot of reasons uh, for percent yield being low. But uh, we want to strive to get our percent yield as high as possible for that reaction. Okay, um, this was an example problem. We're, we're, we'll do this one in class, but for the sake of trying to keep the videos a little bit shorter, we're going to skip through this example problem. It's not in your guided notes anyway. Okay, this, this practice problem, number 40, is in the guided notes. So be, be following along in your notes as we go through this. Okay, it says DDT, and DDT is a huge molecule. Um, here's the chemical formula for DDT. So DDT is an insecticide harmful to fish, birds, and humans, and is produced by the following reaction. Um, so this is how they produce DDT. And so if you notice, this right here is the product that is, they call DDT. Uh, it was an insecticide, so it's a, a chemical spray that they used um, to kill insects. It worked really good. In fact, it worked too good. It started, um, it not only killed the insects, but it killed and was harmful to fish, birds, and humans. So um, the government uh, no longer allows the use of DDT as an insecticide anymore. Anyway, um, this is how they made it. Um, they would react to this guy with this reactant and uh, you would form DDT in water. Okay, So that's the reaction we're going to be working with in this problem. It says, in a government lab, 1,142 grams of C6H5Cl is reacted with 485 grams of C2HOCl3. 
And notice, these were our two reactants. Okay. So it gives us the uh, mounting grams of the two reactants that we need. So this is reactant one and reactant two to make DDT. So this question has four parts to it. Um, we're going to answer each part uh, individually here. Okay, so number one, it says what mass of DDT is formed? So we want to go to mass of DDT. So we want grams of DDT. And it says we're assuming that there was 100% yield. Okay, we're going to assume that we, we, uh, our actual yield was what our theoretical yield should be. It's 100% yield. Okay. So just like we've been working on in the, in the last video, limiting reactant, in order to figure out the mass of DDT that's going to be formed, we need to know which one of these reactants is going to run out first and thus be our limiting reactant. So let's figure that out. So I always start by writing theory. In theory, let's do the mole ratio of what we have. We have two moles of this first reactant. So I always put the one with more moles. This one has two moles and this one only has one. So I always put the one with more moles on top. So we're going to put two moles of C6H5Cl over one mole of the other reactant, which was C2HOCl3. Okay, and we get two moles divided by one mole. In theory, we have a mole ratio of two. Okay, now let's go to what we actually have. So actual. Okay, in order to figure out the actual, we need to use stoichiometry. We're going to take the grams that it gave us and switch it to moles, because we want a mole ratio in the end. And so, 1,142 grams of C6 H5Cl. We're going to put that over 1 and switch it to moles. So just using your roadmap here, if grams of C6H5Cl is on top, we know that it's got to go on bottom. We're trying to go to 1 mole of it. And so we need a molar mass. That's a very large molecule. So use your calculator. We've got we've got uh, six carbons, and carbon has a molar, molar mass of 12. So 12 times six, and then we're going to add in five hydrogens. So that's plus five more hydrogens, just one. And we got one chlorine. If you look on the periodic table, chlorine is 35. And so I'm getting a molar mass for this molecule. That is 112 grams. Okay, so now we can figure out how many moles we have. 1,142 divided by 112. We have 10.2 moles of C6H5Cl. Okay. So that's one of our reactants. Now let's figure out how many moles of the other reactant we have. So it says we're starting with 400 and 85 grams of C2HOCl3. Okay, we're going to put that over 1 and just use your roadmap to switch it to moles. We've got grams of that up there, so we know it's got to come down here. We're trying to go to moles. Now again, a, a very large molecule here, so let's figure out its molar mass. We've got two carbons, so 12 times 2 is 24, plus the 1 from the hydrogen, so it gets us to 25, plus 16 from the oxygen, which gets us to 41. Now we have three chlorines. Chlorine is 35. And so I'm getting a molar mass total of, for this molecule of 146 grams. Okay. So now we're going to take 485 and divide it by 146. And that would be 3.32 moles of C2HOCl3. Alright, now that we have our actual number of moles, 
we can come back over here and do our actual mole ratio. Now again, pay attention to the order that you put them. If we put C6H5Cl on top, for theory, we also need to put moles of C6H5Cl on top. Okay, so what I'm saying is keep the order the same. And so we'll have moles of C2HOCl3 on bottom. Now let's just plug in the numbers that we actually have. So the C6H5Cl, we had 10.2 moles. And for the other reactant, we had 3.32 moles. And now we can divide those to get our mole ratio. So 10.2 divided by 3.32. And I'm getting that our mole ratio is 3.07. All right, now when you get to this point, um, this is where we actually have to do, there's a little bit of thought involved here. For our actual mole ratio, we got 3.07. We wanted 2. So if this mole ratio is too high now, it's too big. It's too big. Now we got to ask ourselves, why is it too big? Why is this number too big? Is it because this number on top is too big, or is it because this number on bottom is too big? Well, let's just kind of reason through this. If this top number gets bigger, what happens to this number? So if this number gets bigger, this number also gets bigger. Well, it's already too big, so we don't want more C6H5Cl. What we want more of is this bottom guy. If this number was to be larger, this number goes down. Whenever you divide by a larger number, the answer goes down. And so we need more, we want this number to be bigger, we need more of this reactant. Okay, and so that's how I reason through it, that's how I pick the limiting reactant. So, um, C2HOCl3 is your limiting reactant. So let's just make note of that, this guy is our limiting reactant. Okay. So we did all of that work just to figure out which one is limiting. But we haven't really answered number one yet. It says, what's the mass of DDT that is formed? Okay, so we want to go to mass of DDT. Um, now, now that we have the limiting reactant identified, we're going to use the stoichiometry based on the limiting reactant. So we're going to use the number of moles of limiting reactant, not the excess reactant. So all of this stuff right here that we figured out before, we're not going to use it. Always start your stoichiometry using the limiting reactant. So give me a second, and I will erase this part uh, that we don't need, okay, just to save space on the board. Um, I would keep it up there, but I, I need more room. Okay. So, let's answer the question, number one. Then. So we're going to start with our limiting reactant. We have 3.32 moles of C2HOCl3. We're going to put that over one. Okay. So we put that one over one. Now we're going to work ourselves across. We're, we're starting with moles of this guy. We're going to work ourselves across the roadmap to figure out the mass of DDT. Okay. So if you've got your roadmap out and, and, and looking at that, we're at moles of reactant right here. So we're at moles of reactant. We want to go across the roadmap. We need to times it by the mole ratio. Well, if moles of C2HOCl3 is on top, we know that it has to be on bottom. We're trying to go to moles of DDT, which is C14, H9, Cl5. Okay. 
Um, all right, now where do you get these mole, uh, the numbers here from for this mole ratio? Well, we get it from the balanced chemical equation. And so we know that we have one mole of DDT, so that's on top, and one mole of our limiting reactant, so it's at a one, one to one mole ratio. Okay. Now in order to go to mass, um, we're just gonna put moles of DDT on bottom. In one mole of DDT, we need to know its molar mass. It's a very large molecule, so let's uh, be careful as you calculate it. We have 14 carbons, so 14 times 12, plus nine hydrogens, so plus nine more, plus five chlorines. And chlorine has a molar mass of 35, so five times 35. And so if you add them all up, I get 352 grams. I'm just going to put DDT right here. Okay, now we can figure out the, the, the amount of DDT that we will form. Let's cross multiply. So 3.32 times uh, 352. And then everything's divided by 1 there. So we form 1,168.6 grams. Of DDT. Okay. So that's the mass of DDT that is formed, assuming that there's a 100% yield. Okay, I'm going to have to erase a little bit um, to fit number two on here. Uh, so I'm going to make note of that before I go on in the video. So we, that will be our theoretical yield. So 1,100. 68.6 grams of DDT in theory. Okay? And so I think I can erase this. Um, if you're watching the video, I'm going to erase it uh, just to create some more space. Okay, so give me a second to erase. So now let's work on part two, which says which reactant is limiting and which is in excess. Maybe I should have asked this first because we already, we already had to determine what was our limiting. Our limiting was C2HOCl3. Our excess reactant was the other one, C6H5Cl. Okay. And we, we did the calculations on that before. So number two, we already did. Number three. What mass of the excess reactant is left over? Now, this is a good question. This is one that students kind of struggle with. We want to know the mass of the excess reactant that's left over. Well, here's our excess reactant. Okay. And so, um, how much of that is going to be left over? So, we're always going to do our, our calculations with our limiting reactant. So here's my plan. Let me see if I can map it out for you guys before we start. We're going to start with our limiting reactant. We're going to take it, um, and we know how many grams of DDT we formed. We've already calculated that. 1,168.6 grams of DDT. Okay, so once we know how many grams of a product you have. Now you can work yourself back across the roadmap and go to grams of your excess reactant that was actually used to make this. So we're going to figure out how many grams of this we used to make our DDT. And then we can subtract off what we started with from what we actually used, and that will be the excess that's left over. 
So that's kind of the, the plan. Let's go through it here. Now, we've already figured out that we're going to form this amount of DDT based on our limiting reactant being this guy. So, let's start with the, the mass of DDT that is formed. 1,168.6 grams of C14 H9 Cl5. We're going to put that over 1. Okay. Now, we're at mass of a product here. If you're following along on the roadmap, we're going to go back across the roadmap, all the way across to mass of that excess reactant. So, let's do that. Okay. And so, grams of DDT, I'm just going to put DDT, save space, in one mole of DDT, uh, what's its molar mass? I forgot its molar mass and I just erased it. Let me figure it out again. So we've got 12 times 14 plus 9 plus 5 times 35. Okay, and I'm getting 352 as its molar mass. So that gets us to moles of the product DDT. Now let's go across the roadmap to moles of reactant. Um, again, if moles of DDT is on top, we're going to put it on the bottom. We're trying to go to the moles of the excess reactant, which was C6H5Cl. Okay, where do I get these numbers from? We get them from the balanced chemical equation. It looks like we have one mole of DDT and two moles of the excess reactant. So a two goes right there. Now, again, we want to go to the mass, so we need to take it to grams, so let's go one more time. Um, moles of the excess is on top, we need it on bottom. And one mole of the excess reactant, now we need its molar mass, so let's figure that out again. So 12 times 6 plus 5 plus 35, 112 grams of C6H5Cl. Okay. Um, so now let's uh, cross multiply there and figure out how many grams of that excess reactant we used. Okay, so I'm getting divided by 352. I'm getting that we used 743.7 grams of C6H5Cl. Now that's how many grams we used. But what this problem is asking is what mass of the excess reactant is left over. So we used this much. How, I, how do we figure out how much is left over? Well, we need to start with what we started with. 1,142 grams and subtract off what we use. So 1,142 grams is what we started with. It told us that in this problem. We're going to subtract off what we used, 743.7 grams, and that will tell us how much is left over. So 1,142 subtract 743.7. So I'm going to have this much left over, 398.3 grams of C6H5Cl left over. Okay, And so that will be your answer to part three. Now we've still got one more part, um, part four. I'm going to erase this. Um, um, part again. So I'm going to erase it real quickly and we'll answer part four.
Okay. All right, so now let's look at part four. It says, if the actual yield of DDT is 200 grams, what is the percent yield? Okay, so we learned earlier that percent yield is equal to the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield theoretical yield then times that number by 100 okay so let's just use that formula plug in the numbers that they gave us okay so we need the actual yield on top it says that the actual yield was 200 grams okay so we're going to put 200 on top 200 grams on top. Now divided by our theoretical yield, this is what we form in theory. And I saved it up here. So 1,000, we, we answered this in part one of this question. So 1,168.6 grams was our theoretical yield. Now we're gonna take that, divide those two numbers and then times it by 100. And that will give us a percent yield for this reaction. So 200 divided by 1,168.6 and uh, then times it by that then times it by 100 and I'm getting 17 17.1 percent yield Seventeen point one percent yield. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's it's very good. Um, that's a pretty low percent yield, but some reactions just really are low. Um, there's a lot of uh, reasons for that, as we talked about earlier. But seventeen point one percent yield. That's a good problem. I know that's a long problem. Hopefully, that makes sense. If you need to go back through the problem and watch it, um, I think it will help. It's gonna it'll start to make sense as you watch it. Hopefully. Okay, last practice problem of the chapter is practice problem number 41. Let's go through it. It says bornite, which has a chemical formula of this, is a copper ore used in the production of copper. When heated, the following reaction occurs. So when you heat that ore, you can take bornite here, so we're reacting it with oxygen, and we can make pure copper. And so a lot of mining operations use chemistry in order to purify their ore. The dirt that they dig out of the ground is, is um, usually never um, pure. So they're going to do some chemistry on it. And in this case, they're taking bornite, heating it up, and, and, and reacting it with oxygen. And, it, and one of the products is pure copper. And so then they can um, isolate that pure copper and, and, uh, and get the product that they want. Anyway, it says if 2.5 metric tons, which is 1,000 kgs, of bornite is reacted with excess O2. Okay, so excess O2. And the process has an 86.3% yield of copper. What mass of copper is produced? So we really want to know what mass of copper was produced. So, okay, a couple of things when we're reading through this. If I were you, I would read through this a couple of times and make sure that it's, you know what it's, what it's saying here. Um, and then I would switch the units. We see kilograms here. We want grams because all of our molar mass is in grams. So let's take kilograms to grams. And if you remember the metric system and which way to move the decimal. Killer hippos die by drinking chunky milk. Okay, if we make the metric system boxes, we've got seven boxes across. We're in the kilo box, so we're in this box. I want to go to grams, which is a base unit, so I need to go one, two, three to the right. So let's move our decimal. There's an implied decimal right here. Three to the right. One, two, three. And so we're going to get three more zeros there. So that's really one million grams of bornite.
That's what we're starting with, one million grams. So I would switch the units to grams. Okay, then I also, you, you've got to recognize that oxygen is the excess reactant. Oxygen here is excess. That means which one is our limiting? The boronide here has to be our limiting reactant. This one's excess reactant. Okay. And it says that this process has an 86.3% yield of copper. What mass of copper is produced? Now, this last part of this, what mass of copper is produced? Isn't that our actual yield? So we're trying to figure out how much copper we actually produce. Okay. It tells us that there's an 86.3% yield. So I'm going to write that up here. 86.3 is equal to the actual yield divided by theoretical yield times by 100. Okay? So that's what we're working with in this problem. How are we going to go about answering this question? What mass of copper is produced? Well, we have a way of figuring out the theoretical yield. That's what we're going to do first. We are going to figure out the theoretical yield of copper. And we do that by using the limiting reactant it told us was boronite, and we have a million grams of it. So let's just start there. One million grams of boronite, which is, again, this chemical formula here, Cu3FeS3. Okay, we're going to put that over one. We're going to try and go, we're going to take our limiting reactant in mass, so grams, and we're going to go clear across the road map to grams of copper. Okay, so that's our plan. Let's do it. Okay, so we got grams of boron on top. So we know it's got to go on bottom. And we're trying to go to moles of boronite. So we'll put that on top. Okay, now we need its molar mass. The molar mass of boronite. Okay. So we've got three coppers. Copper, if you look on the periodic table, is 64. So 64 times 3. Then we're going to add in an iron. One iron is 56. And then we're going to add in three sulfurs. And sulfur is 32, so 3 times 32. And I'm getting a molar mass of 344 grams. That gets me to moles of this reactant. Now we're going to go across the road map. To go across it, we need the mole ratio. So if moles of boronite is on top, it's got to go on bottom. We're trying to go to moles of copper. Now where do I get these numbers from? The balanced chemical equation. Copper, it looks like we have six moles of copper. So I'm going to put six in right there. And how many moles of boronite? Two moles. Okay. Now we're to moles of copper, but we wanted to go to grams of copper, so let's just take it one more step. Okay, if moles of copper is on top, it's got to go on bottom. In one mole of copper, we know that it has a molar mass of 64 grams of copper. Okay. Now we uh, are to grams of copper, we can stop there. So let's take 1 million times 6 times 64. Okay, and then we're going to divide it by 344 and divide it by 2. Okay, so I get this. So let me see what that is. 558,000. 139.5 grams of copper. Now that is our theoretical yield. It's called theoretical yield because if everything happened to be perfect in this reaction, in theory, we could form that many grams of copper. Okay. 
And so when you uh, when you are doing this problem, this is our this is our theoretical yield. Okay, so when we're going to take this number and we're going to plug it in our equation up here, and then we can solve for actual yield. And so that's what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to put 86.3. That was the percent yield that it told us in the problem is equal to its actual yield. It didn't tell us what the actual yield was. We're going to solve for it. The theoretical yield, we just barely did solve for that. 558,139.5 grams. Okay. We also times this number by 100 to get it. And so now we have an equation. Here's our equation. A simple equation with one unknown. If you want to call this x, you could do that. Okay. Now let's isolate x. So it's divide by 100 both sides. Okay. And then I'll simplify it over here. So that gives me 0 0.863 is equal to actual yield divided by 500 58,139.5 grams. Okay. Now to solve for actual yield, we're going to take both sides and times it by 558,139.5. You times both sides by that, it cancels out over here. Okay. And so our answer it's going to be 5,000 or 558,139.5. And we're going to times it by 0.863. Let's see here. So 558,139.5. Times zero point eight six three. And I'm getting that the actual yield was four hundred and eighty one thousand six hundred and seventy four point four grams of seed. Okay, so that's how you would have answered that problem. Notice they're very large uh, numbers in terms of mass, but in mining operations, they're using very large um, quantities there, and so that's, that makes sense to me. So, Okay, that's chapter one. Hopefully, uh, we have learned something uh, further about chemistry. We've learned how to calculate the limiting reactant, and in this video, hopefully, you understand how to calculate percent yield.